I'm deeply honored that uh, I've been invited, so thanks a lot, uh, Daniel, Jacob, and Jocelyn. Uh, I'm not going to tell any stories about Jack, but uh, I can't help saying a few things. Uh, we know that Jack has made us do a number of things that we would not be able to do otherwise. But we have also made him do a number of things that he didn't know he was able to do. <laughs> and uh, my USP, I mean, and that's true of a lot of people sitting over here, my USP is that I, uniquely amongst all of us, have made Chuck dance to Bollywood tunes, <laughs> not once, not twice, but several times over. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty certain that he will continue to do that uh, in, in, the, in the many years uh, when he's going to write even weightier books than he has written uh, so far. Uh, there are many admirable qualities about Chuck, and several, peop several people have spoken about them. But I'd like to refer to a passage from his little masterpiece, uh, Varieties of Religious Experience Today, where Taylor says of William James, that he may eventually come down on one side, but never, never leaving us bereft of the force of the other. Remark remarking on James's view on the struggle between belief and unbelief in a modern Western culture, and which Taylor himself thinks is unlikely to end in a decisive victory of either side. Taylor says, James is our great philosopher of the cusp. He tells us more than anyone else what it is like to stand in the open space and feel the winds pulling you now here, now there. It needed someone who had been through a searing experience of morbidity and had come out on the other side. But it also needed someone of wider sympathy and extraordinary powers of phenomenological description and one who could feel and articulate the continuing ambivalence in himself. Now, this might be true of James, but deep down, I believe this is a profoundly autobiographical remark. I doubt if there could be a more apt self-description of the many philosophical journeys that Chuck has undertaken. And that is what gives his entire philosophical outlook the beauty and power that it has. Let me now come to the topic uh, listed in the program, which I foolishly titled Multiple Social Imaginaries uh, and, and Modern Indian Secularism. I barely began to understand all those multiple social imaginaries. I thought I would when I gave this title. <laughs> but uh, it's really going to be a talk on modern Indian secularism, uh, about which, which has been a central concern for many of us, but, but particularly myself and, 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 and Charles. Now, I, I'd like to approach this by, by referring to an internal debate in India, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, secularism and in, in India has been contested, especially since the mid-'80s. But intriguingly, both those who defend it and those who oppose it share the same conception and some very common assumptions. I can't go into all of them, but I'll list a few. One, that there is only one secularism. Two, that it developed in the West, a gift of Christianity born out of a dialectic between Protestantism and the Enlightenment. That it means st strict separation between church and state, possibly the separation of religion from the entire public life. So a, something like a privatization of religion. It must be a private internal matter. It shouldn't be part of the public square. It shouldn't be part of the state. 
Now, so the difference between those who oppose it and those who defend it, the difference lies in their evaluative judgments. Defenders obviously think of it as a worthwhile ID, and opponents think that it's, uh, it's totally uh, uh, worthless and, and at any rate not really suited to Indian uh, conditions, Indian, the cultural uh, ethos of India. Uh, uh. Now, none of them had really, uh, over the years, I mean, I've noticed this, and none of them had really bothered to examine the real contours of Indian secularism, its real distinctiveness, and how different it is in many interesting ways from any of the models that are found either in Europe or in the United States or in other parts of the world, such as Turkey and perhaps even China and so on. So what is the difference between the two? Uh, and I'd like to take the kind of methodological starting point that Chuck has given us all, uh, which is to look at the, the conditions of the emergence of, you know, the background conditions for the emergence of secularism in India and in Europe. And of course, I'm going to paint a very, I'm going to paint this whole landscape with, very, with a very broad brush. It's going to be utterly exaggerated, and I'm, I'm sure historically and sociologically I would be mistaken in some ways, but I hope those mistakes are interesting. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm particularly looking at Jose here, who's been a very solid critic of all this for me. Uh, so so what, what is it? Uh, I think uh, Jose already presented uh, this uh, uh, when he spoke here. Uh, the form of European secularism arose after a great deal of religious homogenization, after religious uh, diversity had been virtually liquidated. And there's a very interesting story that he told about deconfessionalization and so on. But there's another way of looking at it, which involves the familiar categories of self and other. So I, I, I look at it like this, that there is a kind of a narrative. In this narrative of religious homogenization, uh, we must realize that this whole move towards homogenization comes in the wake of a persistent, deep, and pervasive anxiety about the other, about the other outside, and about the other inside. And where he or she is felt and viewed as an existential threat. So doctrinal, doctrinal differences were not mere intellectual disagreements but was set to undermine the basic trust in one another. The other couldn't be lived with, but simply had to be expelled or exterminated. Now, even in the largely middle belt that Jose again mentioned, uh, Germany, uh, Holland, and, and uh, Switzerland, is the belt of biconfessional states, the others were tolerated, but toleration frequently meant what our friend Le Fugure has called invisibilization, which is a deeply negative privatization. So they were not expelled from the territory, but they were expelled from the public square, the dissenting confessions, right? So the church of other con confessions could, not, could no longer be on the high street, but had to be tucked away in the bylaws, lost the building which didn't look like a church, say a residence hall. So these had become predominantly single religion societies, at least societies where public life is totally captured by one confession. That's the background. There is no secularism yet, but this has already happened. Secondly, these are societies where church-state separation had already occurred. And that's why church-state separation alone does not make secularism, political secularism, right? So the state had already wrested a lot of power from the church. And indeed, as we know, this is part of the, the whole story of the formation of the modern state, that it will be distinct from you know, the, the church. Yet it never occurred to anyone that, that the state would sever, sever its links with the church. It's totally inconceivable at this time that the state wouldn't be religious in some sense. 
So there were strong establishments, strong formal and legal ties with one confession. That's what it meant by confessional states. So uh, this is the real, I mean, these are, there are lots of other things which Chuck and, uh, and Jose have, have, have written about and will write about, uh, which, which, talk, uh, if, uh, which gives a very thick and rich description of the background. But for my purposes, these two features are important because, because I want to make a contrast with the Indian uh, uh, case here. The, so, so, so the deconfessionalization of states, to continue the story just for a bit more, meant a, a weakening of ties of the state with the church, which increasingly came to be viewed not in political terms, but as a repressive component to the wider social domain outside the state, one that was now viewed as thwarting the freedom of and equality among individuals. Now, so the growth of secularism then becomes part of this emancipatory agenda. That's where, that's to my mind, where modern secularism uh, is, is really uh, located. And it emerges in response to, I'm talking about the Western model, in response to what I call intra-religious domination. That is to say, members of one religious community dominating members of their own community, whether it is women or the, or, 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 uh, the lay persons, so there is anti-clericalism, and so on. There are hierarchies within the church and a whole variety of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, forms of exclusions and dominations that are present in in the in in, in the religious domain, particularly in the uh, in the church. <coughs> now, what is the so so? Uh, 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 this is true of the in France, a much stronger version of laissez-faire, but also uh, true of uh, Europe, which has much weaker versions, because there you continue to have. Not only a week, you don't have strict separation, but, and there is a lot of support uh, which is given explicitly or implicitly to a number of uh, churches, uh, particularly the dominant confession church. Okay, so that's Europe. Uh, and now what, is, what are the background conditions in India, at least to the advent of colonial modernity? Very different. There are different faiths, modes of worship, different outlooks, ways of practicing, you know, uh, your fundament, you're, you're playing, enacting your fundamental convictions and so on. So there is what Shaq has called deep diversity here. That's part of the landscape. All of these are at home. There are Syrian Christians, first century AD. There are Zoroastrians coming after their expulsion from Persia. There are Arab traders who settle down uh, uh, with their version of Islam in the 6th, 7th, 7th century, the Jews, not to speak of a variety of South Asian state, uh, religion, uh, faiths, which I'm not even going to mention. But the basic socio-psychological condition here is that these groups feel and are, in some very important sense, secure. They have what we might call a basic collective self-confidence, uh, uh, this, this, this confidence that they'll be present and that they will, their presence will not be questioned. That's there. Uh, in some very fundamental way, they, they trust one another. So there is no deep anxiety about the other, no existential threat about the other. There is, at some very basic level, a comfort zone where everybody is living. Now, that's not to say that there are no de deep disagreements, that there are no conflicts, that there are no skirmishes. But the point is that it doesn't become into a major issue. It doesn't become, uh, it doesn't turn into these conflicts and skirmishes don't become wars of religion. And the crisis that occurs sometimes, and background conditions are shaken, these, the, 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 there is a, that they are being upset all the time uh, in some ways. Uh, and there are three moments that I can think of where 
these, this background condition has been, is, is shaken pretty badly. But somehow, in the, in the pre-colonial era, there is a restoration of these conditions. There's a renewal and restoration of these conditions. And the three moments that I'm, that I, that I'm thinking of, one is the, the, the birth and emergence of what we have late, later called Buddhism. The second, of course, is the coming of, uh, of uh, Islam as a major political force. And the third is the advent of colonial modernity. These are three moments when what this, this background of, of a basic trust and confidence, and that's uh, kind of unsettled in some ways. Now, I'm going to, I, I, initially I thought that I'd talk about the first, but, but I don't have the time to do that. And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the contemporary period. By contemporary, I mean the last hundred years. And Jose, again, I have to refer to him all the time because he, he gave us such a fantastic picture of, of this whole uh, landscape, uh, global landscape. He mentioned that there are collective identities uh, that were formed uh, in India uh, based on religion uh, and, and, and uh, uh, encouraged by, by mobilization of religion. Uh, and as, as, as you might know, this did unsettle that background condition of basic trust and confidence and security and comfort and so on. But this unsettling was, ne was not accepted as a fate. It was contested. It was challenged, a point that Jose didn't really make. The background was articulated. It was spoken about. There was an explicit invocation of it. And there was a defense of this idea of religions at peace with one another. The term used initially was communal harmony. Gandhi used it. And later people talked about interreligious toleration. This is a term used by my colleague and friend Ashish Nandi for this. And even though people began to talk in monotheistic terms uh, here, the monotheism was inclusive, not exclusive. So when Gandhi says, Allah tero naam, Ishwar tero naam, meaning thereby that we speak of you by two names, Allah and Ishwar. All this somehow meant that Allah and Ishwar and Christ and uh, all the other manifest, they were all manifestations of one uh, God. So the translation that we know takes place under conditions of polytheism very easily, these translations were attempted in India by people like Gandhi earlier, earlier and later. Uh, and sometime during this period in the 50s, the word secularism itself began to be used. See, when, when people started thinking, started to think about what the state stance should be in relation to these different groups and different communities. The idea was somehow what the state must do is to maintain, preserve this communal harmony. And what I, what I just mentioned, the word secularism was now begun, had now begun to be used as a stance of the state, that state which preserves communal harmony. And here we see very clearly a profound shift taking place in the very meaning of the word secularism. Secularism is not anti-religious. Secularism is not even necessarily non-religious. It is, a, as I said, a political stance to maintain or foster a certain kind of relation between religious groups under conditions of what Chuck calls deep diversity a very far cry from the more individualist notion that you find in Europe, where state protects individual rights and preserves equality among individuals in the non-religious domain, 
within single religious societies from intrusion by powerful social institutions such as the church. Now one can stop here and claim that the contrast between the two has been, this is, this is really the contrast between the two, over the secular notion, uh, the notion of secularism in Europe on the one hand, and secularism in India, which is a kind of, a, as I said, a form of sociability, a certain way of relation between two groups and so on. But this would be inadequate. I don't think we should just stop here. Because terminating our inquiry here prevents us from grasping the very specific form of sociability, the precise nature of relation between groups that is expected under conditions of modern diversity uh, to be fostered by a, the, the, the political power, by, by, by the state. And, and to understand this, you have to get out of the very loosely articulated public discourse in India, which is full of all this uh, Sarva Dharma Sambhav and uh, uh, interreligious toleration. You've got to move from here to the Constitution and to the Constituent Assembly debates, because only that gives us a better grasp of what the shape of this relation is. If one, does, if one, if one doesn't do that, then one might end up accepting a very naive and often dangerous version of this idea. The idea that the state must allow all religions to flourish and all to grow exactly in the direction in which the state finds them. Now that's, that's a, that in my view is, is a dangerous idea. To allow them to grow with all their warts and everything. So, as I said, many people do indeed interpret Indian secularism in this manner. But I, but I, I also said that would be deeply mistaken because, because it ignores some very crucial features of the background condition. I mean, the, the condition, I mean, I, I mentioned only basic trust and so on, but there's, there's more there than, than this and also certain very important changes that have taken place in this background condition in the 19th and 20th century. So, uh, so what is, what, where is the Indian secularism uh, if it's not just a, a form of sociability, a certain kind of you know, harmonious relation, people, religions being at peace with one another? What, what, where, where, where are we taking it? I think first thing is very clear. The state, as I said, I mean, this is, uh, this, is un this is undoubtedly true. The first thing that the state has to do, whenever it's challenged, whenever the background conditions of comfort and peace between groups is challenged, the state has to restore the trust in that, in, in, the, in, 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 in that uh, whole uh, 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 framework, uh, uh, framework of, uh, of, of conditions which are simply assumed by people for collective agency. And, but very often under modern conditions, this, disturb, this disturbance takes place only when, not when people are at peace with one another, that they may be, but when, having assumed this condition, one religious group attempts to dominate another religious group. So there's no question of expulsion here. There's no question of, of extermination here. But there is a very crucial issue of one religious group trying to dominate another religious group. One religious group trying to exclude, marginalize, humiliate, degrade, and so on, another religious group. And that becomes a very important feature. I mean, if you, that's, a, that's a crucial feature of Indian secularism. Unlike European secularism, which arose in response to what I call intra-religious domination, Indian secularism arose in response to inter-religious domination. Now, that too is not the full story because inter-religious domination was a key issue but not the only issue. There had been, and this is something which is going on for many, many years. You cannot understand the dissent uh, among Buddhists, the formation of uh, Lingayat movements in Karnataka 
a whole lot of bhakti movements, you cannot understand them unless you see that there's always been movements against intra-religious domination and which are given a lot of impetus by colonial modernity in the language and vocabulary, the new modern language and vocabulary of freedom, equality, and rights, which you find in the Indian Constitution. Okay. Right. <laughs> so God doesn't, gods and goddesses don't listen to me. <laughs> Uh, the computer bell is still there. Okay, so, so the simultaneous, so, so here is the contrast. One, uh, European secularism in response, arising in response to intra-religious domination in a single, predominantly single religion society, and Indian secularism arising in response to simultaneously in response to intra and inter-religious domination in a multi-religious society, concerned both with, as I said, uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll say just two things. Uh, for, I mean, I know that some people got 10 minutes yesterday extra, but I mean, you have the bell. Uh, the gods okay. obviously like them. Two more things. <laughs> Okay, uh, I wish you were not the chair. <laughs> it's unfair, unfair. Anyway, two things. One is the notion is that of, uh, not a, the notion that is to be found in the, in the whole stance of the state is one of what I call critical respect. It's not just equal, not just to see that all religions are at peace with one another, not even to see that all religions have respect for one another, or the state must have equal respect for one another, uh, for all, all religions. But to embody a principle of critical respect, you, 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 if you're, I mean, the basic idea is this, that if you really are uh, very keen because you love it or because you care deeply for it, if, you, if you're very keen for something to flourish, then any filth that accrues to it must be removed for it to flourish. And therefore, the critical bit is very important. This, this very important notion of criticality within respect is very important. So the state can be pro-religion. It doesn't have to be hostile. It can be pro-religion and pro-religious freedom, but at the same time, it must be able to act against any form of intra- and inter-religious domination. And the only way it can do that is not by being completely away from religion, as is imagined sometimes by the wall of separation thesis that we, these are two separate domains and so on. But nor does it mean simply being hostile to religion, which is sometimes the case in certain ways of constructing the French laicite and Turkish laicite, and certainly the case in China. And it's not going to be enough that you just support religion, which was the case in you know, Tariq's model of moderate secularism. But you've got to adopt a policy of principal distance, which is that you may uh, engage with religion or not engage with it. You may engage positively <laughs> or negatively with religion. And you may engage uh, positively or negatively in one more than the other, depending entirely upon which of these strategies is going to protect religious freedom of all and undermine both these forms of domination. And so let's not make a fetish of the strategy of wall of separation or whatever. Let's not make a fetish of it. Let's think of the whole thing. Let's think of the, the, the objectives uh, which are common uh, and which are very much uh, specified in the Indian Constitution in terms of reduction of domination and protection of religious freedom. <laughs>